Good day. Thank you for joining us today at Girl Scouts of Central California South Life Skills, Episode 1. Today we'll be learning about basic hand sewing skills. My name is Mary Higgins. I'm a Girl Experience Facilitator here at Girl Scouts of Central California South. And the first thing we're going to do is go over the Girl Scout Promise and Law. On my honor, I will try to serve God and my country, to help people at all times, and to live by the Girl Scout Law. Girl Scout Law. I will do my best to be honest and fair, friendly and helpful, considerate and caring, courageous and strong, and responsible for what I say and do. And to respect myself and others, respect authority, use resources wisely, make the world a better place, and be a sister to every Girl Scout. Well, welcome to my home. Today, I'm here at Girl Scouts of Central California South, and my name is Mary Higgins. My coworker uh, Natasha, we're both Girl Experience Facilitators here at Girl Scouts of Central California South. Some of the things that we're going to work on today is we're going to go over what are basic tools that we use in sewing and hand sewing. Uh, we're going to talk about um, the stitches that you're going to use, how to thread a needle, how to tie a knot, and how to make some simple projects. As well as, I don't know if you've got one of these at your house, but I've got a whole baggie. I've got two daughters that are in Girl Scouts, and we always have a whole baggie of patches that we need to put on their vests. Today we are here to work on a basic sewing class. A list of supplies you're going to need. One of the first things that you have on your list are needles. You of course need needles in order to sew. Today we're going to make this little needle case. That's one of the last projects we're going to use, uh, make today. But you need your case of needles. The other thing you're going to need is some pokey pins. The pins really help you if you are um, making your sewing. You want to keep your fabric in a straight line so it doesn't bunch up on one side or the other. Um, a pin cushion works really well to keep your pins in place. And then I don't know if you guys know this little strawberry thing that hangs down off of your pin cushions. If you give that kind of a, a rub or a squeeze, you can feel it feels different than the regular pin cushion. The pin cushion feels like stuffing, but the, the little strawberry almost feels like it has sand in it. And that's because it's got inside something called emery sand. And for those of you who have beautiful fingernails and paint your nails and file your nails, you know the scratchy stuff that's on those emery boards? That's the same stuff that's in here. And I don't know if you've got um, practice sewing these patches on the back of your, um, on the back of your uniforms yet, but that stickiness that's on the back of your patches, it can get stuck onto your needles and make them all kind of sticky. And if you just take your needles and you poke them in and out of that emery sand on that little strawberry, that's what keeps your needles and your pins nice and clean and nice and sharp if they start getting kind of a little dirty or a little rusty or anything. So the, the, that sand and that strawberry, there's a reason for that. So the next thing you're gonna need, of course, is thread. Now I got this cute little sewing kit that has all different colors of thread that are in it. So when you're sewing your patches, you can match up your thread color to the color of your patch, or you can get something that looks like this. It looks like shiny silver thread um, to my camera here, but if I open it up and I look at it, it almost looks like fishing line, like you use when you go fishing. It's called invisible thread. And it's about as big as one of your hairs. Like if you're, you're brushing your hair, it's so skinny that you can barely see it. But it's a monofilament line, which is the exact same stuff as fishing line. And if you sew with this, then you can't see your stitches. So you can use that to sew your patches also. Very important when you're sewing is to have a thimble available to you. Now in a lot of sewing kits, they come with these little thimbles like this, but my fingers are kind of large and it always hurts my finger to use those thimbles. 
So sometimes you can find rubber thimbles like this. This is one of my favorite ones that I like to use. And you can even find thimbles that are made out of leather like this that are stretchy. And you can get them broken in just like you break in your tennis shoes so that they fit your finger really nicely. The thimble protects your finger so the needle doesn't poke your finger. So those are a couple of different kinds of thimbles. Now, we also have three different kinds of needle threaders I'm gonna show you. This one came in my little sewing kit. This is what it looks like when you buy them separately. So these are very good to use. The only problem is that this little part in here is just some wire that's been crimped in a piece of metal. And once I use those five or six times, they tend to fall apart. So those are handy, but they're not very um, long lasting. Another one that you can get that I really like, and I'm leaving it on the card in the package here so that you can see it easier, is this one. And this is a needle threader too. It's very skinny. It's, here I'm gonna go ahead and take it out of the package. It's very skinny. It's skinny enough to fit through the eye of a needle. So you, can, you can't hardly even see it when I hold it sideways, but it's very skinny. And those, this end goes through your tiny needles and this end goes through your fatter needles. So this is made out of metal. You don't want to bend it because it will snap, but that's a very long lasting needle threader. And this one is my favorite. It looks like a cute little birdie, almost like a hummingbird. And it has a tiny little metal beak that has a little notch in it. And that is how you can thread your needles too. I'll show you how to use that one when we get started to threading our needles. So after you have uh, your thimbles, you need some scissors. You can use nice big sewing scissors like these. Um, you can have tiny little detail scissors like these. You can even get something called thread snippers like those that are very handy to use when you're doing sewing machine sewing. And if you're interested, we may at a later date have a sewing machine class as well. Um, another scissors that's really fun to use are these. They're called pinking scissors. I don't know if you can see the zigzags that are on those, but the zigzags, when you have cloth that has a woven texture, you know, their threads are crisscross from each other. If you just slice it, those threads can start to come apart. And if you use this zigzag cutter, it will make those um, fabrics more stable and less likely to start peeling apart on the edges. So fabric is the next thing we're gonna need. Um, you can use felt, you can use fabric. You can also, today and some of our projects, if you have a shirt with a button missing, this can be your fabric that you can work on today. So um, fabric, you can have any kind, any weight, you can use, Scraps of your blue jeans, if you cut off your blue jeans for the summer to make shorts, you can use that bottom part to sew with today. Whatever fabric you may have. What I like to do is I like to keep scraps from my projects when I have to cut out my pattern. If I have all the little pieces, I'll put those in a bag for like my swaps or all my other little projects that I've got going on. Um, patches, we already mentioned you need your bag of patches today. You need a button. Now, you can have a big button like this that makes it very easy to see. I got specifically a giant button so I could show you easily how to sew. But also on your shirts, if you notice, a lot of times the manufacturer, like here's my big cozy sweater that I wear outside when it's chilly at night. And down here at the bottom where it buttons up, you'll notice that the manufacturer usually gives you a couple of extra buttons right there, just in case you lose a button on your shirt. And usually the giant one is the one that's for the middle of your shirt, and the tinier one is the one that's for the sleeves of your shirt. So if you have a really nice shirt, sometimes the manufacturer will give you extra buttons for them. So, some of the things that you can have today that aren't necessary, but it's nice to have around, um, is quilting, um, I'm sorry, fabric glue. 
This is one of my favorite fabric glues. It's a little bit stinky, but the reason I like it is that it works really fast. It's almost like the super glue of fabric glues. The problem with this glue is that it doesn't last very long. Like if I use it for my girls' patches on the vest, after I wash it one or two times, that glue breaks and starts coming off. So it works really well if you're gonna put your patches on your vest temporarily, just to hold them down so you can sew around them, but it doesn't work very well for clothes that you're going to wear and get some use. If I were just like making a picture on my wall, I could use this and it would be just fine because I'm not gonna to touch it on my wall and it will stay, it won't break. But if I use it for regular clothing that's going to get some use, this is not a great um, fabric glue for that. But it's very handy to have. It's a really good alternative to use if you don't have a, um, if you don't have a hot glue gun, um, because of course you're not gonna burn your fingers on this but you will get glue all over your fingers. Some of the other nice things to have that are not necessary, you can get these little measuring things and it helps you measure your clothes. You can have this kind of measuring tape that helps you measure how, diff how long your arms are or how big around your neck is. So measuring tapes are nice. Also, there's another tool called a seam ripper. It looks like that. Like if you go to, um, to Walmart, actually I picked this up as a present for my daughter. You can go to Walmart and for like $10 or $12, you can get a sewing kit that has all these pieces in it. Now there's some pieces in here that aren't really necessary just for basic sewing, but um, I wanted to let you guys know what they were so you could recognize them. One of the things that our troop got so that we can bring it to troop meetings, this is a tiny little ironing board. So it's just a tiny one with little legs that we can take it to our troop meeting and set up so that when we're ready to iron on our patches, we've got our iron and you can iron on the patches. But like I said, again, um, sometimes that, that adhesive, you need to check it with, uh, double check it with some stitches to make sure it doesn't come off. Um, um, also, when you're sewing, it's a really nice idea to, when you have to fold your fabric over, to take that iron and iron it, and that will give you a nice crisp edge. A lot of people who are used to sewing for a long time um, sometimes get a little lazy and don't do the ironing step, and you really can tell when somebody takes the time and irons their pieces and makes them precise because everything's nice and neat and all their corners match up. If you're not trying to go for perfection, you don't have to iron everything every time. But if you're like trying to make something for a present for somebody or to enter a quilt into a quilting contest or something like that, you'll want to make sure that you're doing things as precisely as you can. Um, so the last thing I was gonna share with you was my sewing box. This sewing box stays at the side of my couch all the time. And it's nice because it has a tray and all my little bits and pieces and loose um, things. Here's another little kind of, of uh, sewing glue that keeps your things from coming undone. And it fits all of my, my needles and everything. So it's nice to have one of those if you decide that sewing is a craft that you would like to get into. It's really nice to have a nice little sewing box that you can keep all of your things organized in. And um, oh, the other thing I put on the list of supplies is stuffing. So you can get things like lamb's wool in the foot care aisle at CVS. You can get cotton balls from your closet. You can get, um, stuffing from the sewing store to stuff things with. Um, if you have an old stuffy that you're gonna throw away, you can pull the stuffing out of that and recycle it. Or if you have an old sock bag in, in your house, like when you wash the clothes and you have one or two um, socks that are, are, you know, stray socks that don't have, that lost their match and you keep them in a bag, 
ask your parents if you can borrow a couple of those. Well, you're not borrowing them, you're going to cut them up. And you can cut up those socks and use those as stuffings. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Okay. One of the girls wants to know if they re really need the iron. Um, today you don't need the iron. Um, if you want to use the iron and your mom is there to help you, you can use it for some of the projects we'll do a little bit later. Um, but I'm gonna show you, the things I'm gonna show you, you don't absolutely have to have it. It's just a good thing to know how to use it. Um, the reason you would use an iron, like say you needed to fold your fabric on this line right here, then um, you would fold it over like this and then you would take that iron and you would rub it like that. And then if my iron were hot, it would keep it nice and flat and then I wouldn't have to hold it here with my finger. And so that way it makes it a little easier to stitch when things are held in place on their own and you don't have to try to hold it and sew it at the same time. So the iron is helpful. It's not absolutely necessary, but it is helpful. So I'm going to go ahead and use some pink thread and I'm going to put down this white piece of paper on the table so it's easier for you to see. You see these little notches that are in the thimble? What happens is the um, needle, okay, there we go. So see your, your, th your needle just kind of like slips into one of those notches and that keeps it from sliding. Like if I just had it on my finger, my finger would slide like that. But if I have it against this needle, it's gonna catch in those catches and it won't slide. See it slides down here where there's no catches, but it won't slide up here where there's those little, little bumps that catch it. And that's the purpose of a needle. Uh, I'm sorry, a thimble. And you can kind of see it a little bit easier on this plastic one. See how it fits in those notches? And that way it's not going anywhere when you push on it. Today we're going to use a piece of thread. Now in sewing, there's an old fashioned thing that my mother taught me a long time ago. She taught me to do what's called sniff a yard. A yard is a, a unit of measurement that is three feet long. And when you buy fabric in the, in the uh, store, they usually sell fabric in yards. And for most people, let me scooch over here. Well, maybe I'll use this arm instead. Most people, if you hold your arm side out from your body and put this one right here by your nose, most people, that's about a yard. Now, when you're a kid, it's not quite a yard. So you may have to stretch a little bit to sniff a yard. But the older you get, the more you can tell, okay, I need to move my arm a little bit, and that's about a yard. So today, the amount of thread that we're all going to use, I want you all to try to sniff a yard and take one thread and put it against your nose and put your, your thimble, your, your roll of thread out that far. And once you have a piece, as long as your arm, then you're going to snip it off of your spool of thread. So you never really want to use um, use something that's longer than that. Um, if you use a piece that's more than twice as long as your arm, then you're going to be more likely to get it tied up in knots. Because even this piece is, is pretty long for the projects we're going to use today. So when I, when I double it up, it's about, it's about a little over a foot long. What we're going to do is we're going to thread the needle. So for those of you who do not know how to thread a needle, the first thing you want to do is you want to check to make sure that your thread is nice and sharp. You don't want it to have like a lot of fuzzy strings hanging off of the edge of it. You want to make sure it's nice and straight and flat. And then what I do is I just lick my fingers. Some people put the thread in their mouth, but I just lick my fingers so my thread doesn't get too wet. And then I kind of rub that wetness on the end of the thread to get it all collected into one spot. Then you're gonna take your needle and you're going to see 
when you rotate your needle around, you'll see that, see where you can see the hole and you have it sideways, you can't see the hole. You wanna be able to see the hole and you can either have it where the hole is towards you or to the side of you. And you just wanna take that th thread and you poke it right through that needle. Now, if it's nice and smooth and together, it should go through. Now, if that's really tough for you, you can use the needle threaders. But that is the basic way to get your needle thread. I was taught so that you don't look at the needle because if you take look at the needle with the hole, if you look at the hole and you're poking at you, it's kind of harder to see. But if you hold it sideways so you can't see the hole and then you poke sideways, it's a little bit easier. Oops, dropped my thread. Okay, so like I said, they have these needle threaders that come in your sewing kits. These are very easy to use. You just take um, the eye of the needle here and you put that metal right inside. I can't get my camera to focus. Can you see that now? There we go. So you get the eye of the needle. It's hard doing this through the camera. There we go. You put the, the thread right through that needle, just like that. So it stands right, right through there. Once you have that through the end of your needle, then you get one side of your thread. And you put that right through that square right there. Once you have it through the loop of metal, then you're going to pull this needle threader back and it will pull the thread onto your needle, just like that. I'm going to go ahead and show you my little birdie needle threader. So the, per the process is almost exactly the same. You put that little needle right through the, the beak of the bird, right through the eye of the needle. And then you put your thread over top and see how it slides back and forth. And there's a little groove right at the end that makes it stop sliding. And then you kind of close that down a little bit. It helps hold your thread in place. And then when you pull your needle off, it pulls that thread right onto your needle. Just like that. So what we're gonna start with is um, just get a scrap of fabric. It doesn't have to be a fancy piece of fabric, just a little piece of fabric that we're going to practice your stitches. Now, in order to do stitches, you have to first tie a knot in the thread of your, um, in the thread that you have on your needle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the ends of my thread and I'm gonna match them up. So I have them together, oops. And I'm gonna pull my, my needle so it's right in the middle of my thread. So my thread's almost matched up there. And I'm just going to put it over top of my index finger and pinch it like that. I'm gonna, I go around my index finger two times like that. So you wrap it around twice. And then what I do is I just roll it off my finger. Just like if you had glue on your finger and you were rolling the glue off your finger, you roll those threads off your finger, just like that. And then you see it has this little clump right there. And then you just take it and you pull it down to the end of your thread. And when you pull it, it makes a nice knot. I'll demonstrate that one more time. Put it on my finger. You can go around once or twice. 
then you just roll it off and you want to roll roll it so that thread kind of gets twisted up in a knot and then you pull on that knot and it should stick in the end it's not always the best knot sometimes you have little loops at the end but when i stitch my patches on the girl's vest i make that hidden inside anyway so you never really see it ah you know what i just realized the reason my thread keeps coming out of this needle this needle don't know if i can get my camera to focus it's a very special needle i'm going to draw a picture of it for you so this needle looks like this And up at the top, instead of just having a loop like this, it looks like this, where it has a little channel, like that. And every time I was trying to do it, the, the needle would come out that side. This is a special needle that you can, you can thread like this. You can thread it on sideways and then pull it out the top but it doesn't like, oh, there it goes. It finally snapped on. So let me try that one more time and show you. I don't think I caught that on camera. It doesn't really like this fat thread either. So with these special needles that are designed like that, all you have to do is put your thread over the needle and slide it sideways to where it catches in that knot and then you slide it up to the top and then it, it just slides right into your needle and now it's threaded. Oh, one more tool I forgot to show you that's really handy to have. And I reminded myself when I saw that is you can get something called a fabric pencil or a fabric pen and you can draw on paper with it, but it's made out of like a chalk kind of material so that when you draw on fabric and then you go to wash it, it'll wash right out. So um, if I wanted to make a line that I needed to sew on, I could use a fabric pen. But you want to make sure and use a washable one. So um, I like to, like I said, I use up scraps. This was a scrap of a piece of uh, Girl Scout felt that I had, and it was part of the salvage. But I like to save it, and it had some lines on it, so I can kind of see through it through the backside. So that's going to be my guide of how I'm going to stitch my line. So the first stitch we're gonna work on is something called a straight stitch. So to do a straight stitch, you just go straight down your fabric to the back side, and my knot holds the fabric. And then you're just gonna come right back along that same line to the top. Be very, very careful if with doing this sewing project, these needles and threads are very hard to see, especially if you're in a room that like has carpeting and you don't want ever anybody to step with on them on bare feet. So always when you're working on sewing, you wanna make sure you're like over a table or over something that can catch your needles and pins when you're working. And I can tell you from experience, I learned that the hard way. Do a straight stitch. Again, what we're doing is we're just going down the fabric and then you don't even have to pull it all the way through each time. You can just take your needle and come right back up the fabric just a little bit away from here. And then you can go down the fabric again. And you can come right back up the fabric just a little ways more. And you can go down the fabric again. And you can go right back up the fabric a little ways more. So there is what your stitches are going to look like with your thread. So already I made three stitches with my needle and I didn't even pull it through yet. So that's one of the ways that you can tell it's a straight stitch is because you see a stitch, you see the fabric. You see a straight stitch, you see the fabric. So that is called a straight stitch. Now you can use straight stitches to uh, make a decoration, like to outline something. You can also use straight stitches if you want to sew two pieces together. So I just put two pieces of my felt together and say I'm going to sew a straight stitch all the way back to the other side. I'm just going to go down. Now this time I'm going through both pieces of fabric and then I'm going to come up. 
Now you notice when I go through both pieces of fabric, it makes my stitch longer because it's harder to make tiny stitches when you're going through thick fabric. And this and felt you. is kind of thick. So if you want it to stay tiny, you'll want to just go up and down and up and down. And then that, that way your stitches will stay tinier. You can make sure they're close together. So that is called a straight stitch. Okay. So that's what your straight stitch is like on the inside. So I'm going to go ahead and show you one of the uh, projects we're going to work on today. Um, I showed you a little earlier. This is my needle book that I made. And today we're going to, everybody's going to make a needle book. But if you notice, the only stitches I used for the whole project were just straight stitches, just like that. So your straight stitch is a very handy stitch to have. So sometimes when you sew, you don't want to have double threads. You just want to sew with one thread at a time. In that case, you would just take one piece of thread over your finger and wrap it around twice and then rub it off to make a knot. So that's how you, and then your other piece of thread, as you sew, um, then you would just take your thread and pull one edge of it to keep making your thread longer and longer as you sew. So that's one way you can sew with a really long thread, but it is short for a little while. And then as you sew, you can move that tail longer and longer and longer. And that way you don't have to change threads as often. So sometimes you'll want to sew with a double thread. Sometimes you want to sew with a single thread. If you're sewing something like you have a hole in your stuffy and it's the second time you've sewed it or the third time you've sewed it with a single thread, then maybe that stuffed animal gets a lot of love and maybe next time you need to sew it with two threads to make it stronger the next time. So, okay. I'm going to go ahead and double knot my thread again so that you can see it better on the camera. Move on to our next stitch. Um, so what I'm just going to do is use this open edge of my scraps here. So I've got my new thread and I'm going to take my needle and I'm I always start from the bottom side. To me, it's more comfortable um, starting on the bottom side when I do this stitch. So I start on the bottom side and my knot stays on that bottom side. And then I always place my thread over the top. Some people just let the thread slide around, but to me, I like it better when I can place the thread where I want it to go. And then I put my needle through the back side and come up again. Now you want to try have your stitches all come out like they're on an invisible line so they're all the same size. So to do an overcast stitch or an overhand stitch you just keep going from the back side to the front side. You go from the from just from one side to the other. You only have your needle going in one direction, from the back to the front, from the back. See, and this is another reason why I like to put my needle, my thread in the back, because if I pull my needle up and I pull my thread, and my thread is in the way, now look what happens. Now I'm I've made like a knot, and my thread's all mixed up. So I'm like making an X and I don't want to have X's. I want to have just straight stripes. So to fix that, I um, can go back underneath that stitch. But the best way is to put your thread 
up above it so you don't make that mistake in the first place. So put your thread up, then take your stitch. And that is called the overcast stitch. Now you can do this, like I said, if you're, um, if you just want to do it for decoration on the edge of your t-shirt, you want to add some pretty stripes of ribbon or something, you can sew ribbon on the edge of your t-shirt and do it that way. You can also use it to attach two pieces of fabric together. Now, remember how I said that you use pins to hold your fabric uh, projects together? If I don't hold this together with pins and I just hold it with my fingers, then I could end up, you know, having one side getting scrunched a little bit and wrinkly, or I could end up going off sideways a little bit. So the best way to keep your project straight is if you're going to join two pieces together is you get them all lined up and then you pin them like this. You go down and up and down and up and you pin them the whole length. Now this is the example where I just went through one length, one um, thickness of fabric. And now I'm going to show you where you can use that same stitch to sew together two thicknesses of fabric. I've pinned them together and I'm still just going down and up and down and up and down and up from the back side to the front side. So your needle's always just going that one direction from the back to the front, from the back to the front, never from the front to the back unless you started it from the front to the back from the front to the back but like i said for me it's a lot more comfortable to just do it from the back to the front it's possible to do it the other way from front to back front to back front to back but it's more comfortable some people find it more comfortable one way some people find it more comfortable the other way this is the way i find it more comfortable so after you do all of the overhand stitches that you want to do, this time do not cut your string off. I'm going to show you how to make a knot at the end of your stitches. Now this is how you can um, do a knot on your project. So you want to have your needle pointing the same direction that your thread is coming out of your project. So you're going to take your thread, put your needle right next to it, and you're going to take your thread and go around the needle one, two, three times. So you see it's wrapped around my needle like that. And then once I have it wrapped around my needle, I'm going to poke it right back down not in the exact same spot where it came out, but really close to it. Okay. And then when I poke it through, when I pull it out, as you pull it very carefully and very gently, so those twists don't come undone, then it gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it makes a knot. And this is also how you make a French knot in embroidery, but they also make very good ending knots for your sewing. So let's practice that one more time. So when your thread comes out of your fabric, it doesn't work if your needle is pointing the same way as your fabric. Twisting it and going through, it's not going to make a knot. It's just going to slide right through. You have to make sure your needle is pointing away from your fabric, the same way that your thread comes out. So you're going to take that needle, put it right next to your thread, wrap it around once, twice, three times, and then you very carefully pull that needle back and go right through to the back side, right close by where it came out. 
And then when you pull on that thread, it's gonna make a nice little French knot. Okay, that's kind of a, of a fancy knot. Another knot that I learned like when I was like, I bugged my mom so much to teach me to sew when I was like five years old. So this is how I learned to make a knot when I was just five years old. I take one little stitch in one spot and I make a stitch right on top of that same spot and I make another stitch right on top of that same spot and I make three stitches right on top of the very same spot. So they're all on top of each other. And then what I do is I go right through the center donut hole of those three stitches one time. And that's another way you can make a knot. Okay, let me show you one more time. Mary, so, one of the girls asked if that knot that you showed them works for only that stitch or can it work for any of them? The French knot can work for any stitches. Okay. And this knot can actually work for any stitches. Um, the thing is, depending on what project you're doing, sometimes you want your knots visible where people can see them. And that's why the French knots are pretty. If you look at it really close up, it almost looks like a rosebud. Um, but if you're doing this knot, this knot's not quite so pretty. So this would be a knot I would use if I didn't want people to see it. So again, this is the simpler knot where you just make one stitch, you make a stitch in the exact same spot. Sorry, I've got to put my glasses back on so I can see. You make two stitches in the exact same spot. You make three stitches in the exact same spot. And then you go through that stitch sideways, just like kind of right through the middle of the donut hole to tuck your tails in. And now I'm starting to run out of thread. So this is where um, you can cut your thread off. Now, if you've got a French knot, you want to make sure you um, leave a tiny little bit of a tail so that French knot doesn't come loose. So the next thing we're going to go on to is sewing on a button. Let me get some new thread on this needle so I can show you. Okay, well, that's one of the problems. I tried to put too fat of a thread on too skinny of a needle and see how I pulled those strings right out of the end of my needle spreader. So that's why I say that these ones, these cheapy ones are handy to use, but sometimes they don't work so well. Let me find a needle that has a bigger eye. That will help me. Here's one. Now, always, if you're going to switch needles, make sure you put your needle into a pin cushion or something like that, or into your needle book. Because like I mentioned before, if you live in a place that has carpet, you never want to have needles or pins on your carpets where you could step on them with bare feet. And I had a very bad habit when I was a little girl of putting my needles in the fabric arm of the chair or couch where I was sitting. And my mom always told me, don't do that. You could get hurt. You could bump those with your hands. And I didn't listen. And one day, my mom called me to come do the dishes, and I was exasperated at her calling me. So I took my hand and I slammed it down on the chair where I was sitting. And yeah, I got a needle in my finger. So it's a hard lesson to learn sometimes that moms are usually right. Okay. So we've spent the last hour learning how to do the very, very basics of sewing. We've learned about our tools. We've learned about how to tie knots to start, how to tie knots to end. We've learned our straight stitch. We've learned our overhand stitch. Now we're going to learn how to sew on a button. So we're going to thread our needle. And I like to use 
a double thread to thread my needle when I sew buttons. Now, when I was your age, I went to a special Girl Scout day camp and my teacher taught me a trick. She said, if instead of just using a single thread through your needle, if you go ahead and make a double thread and make your double thread go through your needle like that, and then you have four pieces of thread on your needle. And then when you go to sew, see how that has four pieces of thread all together? And that way, when you sew on your button, you can sew on your button much faster because your thread is thicker. But just for demonstration purposes today, and just because this is the way I like to sew on buttons, I only like to use two. But sometimes if I'm in a hurry, I will use four. So the thing you want to make sure and do when you're sewing on a button you want to make sure the fabric you're using to put the button on has a secure base because if you're just going to sew on a button and you're just going to use that one little knot and you're going to start sewing on your button buttons get a lot of use and the longer you use that button the more you pull on that knot eventually someday that knot will work right through your fabric and come through the other side and then your button falls off and then you have to sew on your button again. So to make sure your knot doesn't work its way through your shirt when you're using it, what you want to start is you put your knot in your fabric and before you even pick up your button, you're going to go ahead and make some crisscrosses in your fabric like this, up and down, up and down, and now I'm gonna go side to side, side to side, two times two stitches each way, right on top of each other. So now what I've done is I've made myself a strong base. So if I put my, need, my thread right through the middle of that, it's not gonna pull out and pull through my fabric because I've made myself a nice strong base. So once you have your X, what you're going to do is you're gonna come up right through the bottom in the very, very center of that X. Okay, I'm gonna try to come up right through the middle. And when you come up through the middle, now you're gonna take your button. Now some buttons have two holes and some buttons have four holes. Now there's two different ways that you can sew your buttons. The two hole is a little, little bit easier, um, but the um, it depends upon what kind of use you are using for your button. If you're doing something that doesn't get a lot of use, like you know how some shirts have those two little buttons on your dad's collar at the point? Those don't get a lot of use, so they usually have two buttons. Sometimes the buttons that are on the cuffs of your sleeves um, only have two holes. But most buttons that aren't like on your coat that get a lot of use will have four holes. And there's two different ways you can um, sew the buttons on those four holes. One way, you can sew the stitches lots and lots of times, just like this. So you have two rows of stitches, and you just make circle stitches right through those two holes, and you go like that. Another way you can make stitches is crisscrossing like that. And some people, if they know that their coat is going to get a lot, a lot of use, they even do both like that. So today, my string isn't very long. So we're just going to do the straight stitches like that, okay? So also one of the things that the straight stitches work really well for is if you don't want your button to rotate. Sometimes you can find fancy buttons that look like animals or look like heart shapes or something like that. And maybe you want them to stay right side up on your project. So you can sew them so that they don't rotate around. Other times you can sew um, things where they can um, spin around. Now, one of the secrets I learned 
when I was your age at my Girl Scout day camp is when you're sewing your button, you don't want to just sew your button like this and pull your stitches tight because then your fabric is so tight against your button, you have no space for the other piece of cloth that you're trying to button to it. So you want to always make sure you're leaving a tiny bit of space right there between your fabric and your button. So you do not want to pull your stitches tight. You want to leave them a little bit loose. So you can sew three stitches on one side. And then you can sew three stitches on your other side. You just go up and down. Make sure you're leaving some space in your stitches so your button's not so tight against the fabric. Up and down. A second time. And then go up and down a third time. Now some people finish it off just like that and they'll flip it over and they'll do either a French knot or that three times knot that I showed you to. Um, both of those work and they just leave their button right like that. But my Girl Scout teacher taught me an extra trick. You take your butt, your needle and you go through, but you don't come up through the button. You keep your thread on the back side of your button and then you circle your thread around your button three times or maybe even more. And you make that thread go around your button and then when you pull it tight, it pulls all those stitches together. And it makes almost like, you know how like you have the button on your jeans that have that kind of little hard stem that's underneath the button on your jeans? It almost makes a stem out of those stitches and it keeps everything nice and tight and together and then you go right back down through the bottom. And once you're down through the bottom, this is one of the places where I go ahead and I do the one, two, three uh, knots instead of doing a French knot. Go once, go twice, go three times, and I go through it sideways just to get it one more time and then I snip it off and then you have your button. So say if I wanted to button this piece of fabric, I could make a cut on this side and then I could fold it over and push my button right through and my button would work. So what we're going to do today is we're going to learn how to make one of these um, felt uh, needle um, holders. If you don't have felt, you can use any material that you like, but you want to try to find some kind of material that won't fray and fall apart on the edges. So felt works really well. Um, just as long as you have something that, um, like if you have t-shirt fabric, that's a knit and knits don't fall apart the way like woven material does. So um, as long as you're careful with your book, it probably won't fall apart on the edges, but you just want to make sure that um, it um, is the right size. You want to make sure that your needles fit inside of it, that their needles are not so long it pokes out the outside. So one of the things I did, I don't know if your needles today came in this little paper holder. Sometimes you find needles at the store that come in a little paper holder, but the paper holder usually doesn't last very long. It kind of falls apart. So what I like to do is I'll take a piece of fabric and I'll measure that paper holder. And you can use a pencil to trace around it for a pattern. So you can take a piece of fabric and just like Laurel said, she likes to embroidery. After you have made one of these, you can, um, can make a design with stitches on it and give it away to somebody as a gift. So 
You can draw around that to make the right size of the pattern, or you can just eyeball it like I'm doing. The nice thing about felt is it's very forgiving. Um, there's lots of other fabric you can use. This is some fabric I had in my, in my um, sewing basket. It's called quilted fabric. You can see that it has fabric on one side and fabric on the other side. It has stuffing that's sewn in the middle of it and then stitched. So once you have the size of the needle book that you want to use, you want to get another piece of felt and you want to draw the lines just a tiny bit smaller, just a tiny bit smaller than the um, piece you just cut, okay? Because you want your book cover to be larger than the pieces inside. So you're gonna cut a, a rectangle out of whatever fabric you want to be on the outside. And then you can cut two pieces of fabric that are small enough to go on the inside. Okay, so you see how, let me make sure those are nice and small. Okay, so you can see how my piece, you can see the orange all around the outside of my, my pieces. So I just stacked them three pieces tall. My big piece is on the bottom and my two smaller pieces are on the top. Um, I, I just made a, a line down the middle of my fabric so that I knew where um, the bottom of the book was. My fabric, when it was folded away in the cupboard, had a crease in it. So I'm not gonna follow that crease. I wanna follow the crease that I, that I drew on there. So I make sure that my pages are centered. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a pin in one side to hold my pages exactly where I want them to be. And then I'm gonna put a pin in the other side to hold my pages exactly where I want them to be. Okay. I'm actually gonna start with my knot on the inside of my book. I see where I want my needle to go right on the inside. Make sure before I bring it through, it's exactly where I want it to be. Sorry, I'm not in the middle of the camera. There we go. And move that spot over. Okay, so that's where I want my inside knot to go. And then I'm just gonna do a straight stitch. That same stitch that we started right at the beginning of class, all the way down that line and this will be the spine of your book. So you wanna to try to take tiny stitches, which is all the way down the middle. So you're gonna do all kinds of tiny little straight stitches all the way down that line in the middle of your book. So there's my book. My line isn't perfectly straight, but it's okay. It's pretty straight. My book is just gonna stay in my sewing kit anyway. It's not like I'm make it, making it for a contest or anything. So here's my stitches on the inside of my book. So now I'm going to make my stitch to finish it on the inside of my book because I don't want my knots and my tails to show on the outside of my book. So I'm just gonna do the one where I make one, two, three stitches all on top of each other. And then I go through sideways just to keep my tails tucked in. And once I'm done making my knot, then I can take off my pins, make sure I'm putting my pins and my needles in my, so my pin cushion so I don't poke anybody. And then there is my book where it has all the pages to put all my needles.
you just fold it in half like that now I'm looking at my book and even though I pinned it some of my pages aren't quite even and so if I didn't like that, what I could do is I could go, okay, I need to trim my pages up. So if I think I need to make them a little skinnier, I can just go ahead and trim them up. Even after I've sewed them together. So they look nice and straight. Maybe that one's a little bit long and I'll fix it like that. You can just trim up the pages and make them all straight. And there you have it. A needle book. Now we're going to start the pin cushion. You know, I was going to make a pin cushion out of just this tiny little piece, um, but you can use a fabric um, out of any size piece that you want to. Like I have this, like I said, I had this scrap of fabric in my fabric uh, cupboard. So if I wanted to make a big pin cushion, I could. Sorry, it's kind of hard to do this with holding my camera with one hand and cutting with the other. But I could cut a piece like that big. And now I can have a pin cushion that's that size. That's going to be like a big pin cushion. And the reason I like this fabric is because this extra piece of stuffing can help me close up the hole that I make inside that um, will keep the stuffing inside. One of the things that I love the most about being a Girl Scout is you learn how to fix things on the go. And my tripod just broke, and I don't know if you can see this, but I fixed it with a hair string. So you learn how to fix things. If things go wrong, you figure out how to fix things, and you make the best of it, and you go on. Okay. This is going to be my pretend stock, sock. So I've got a stocking here. So if you don't have any stuffing, you can get stuffing, like I said, from the fabric store. You can use lamb's wool from the uh, pharmacy, or you can just use pieces and scraps of fabric. What you're going to do is you're going to take your sock and you're just going to start cutting up those socks in little tiny strips and little tiny pieces. And you can make stuffing out of any kind of fabric. You just clip it up and clip it up and clip it up. And pretty soon you're going to have a pile of stuffing. And so that's how you can recycle things. So recycling things is a really good way to make the world a better place because then you don't have as much clothes go to um, trash trash um, places where there's even some fashion designers that are using recycled clothes to make new fashions because there's so much material that's going to landfills around the world that it's um, a really waste of our resources so since girl scouts use resources wisely i bet the person that came up with that idea was probably a girl scout or a girl guide and knew about yeah. using their resources wisely Okay, so there's my pile of homemade stuffing. So that will work. So what we're going to do, so I just have my little piece of fabric that I'm just going to make a tiny little um, sewing pin cushion with. And what I'm going to do is um, if you're going to make a pin cushion that's uh, square or rectangle, you just start with a longer rectangle and you fold it in half. If you wanted to make a pin cushion that was round like this tomato, you could start in a big circle and stitch all the way around the big circle. Um, there's, you can make um, your pin cushions in any shape that you want to. In fact, I wanted to show you a cute little book that I found that I was gonna work with my kids that you could make these mini treats and it's one of the klutz books and they have on the back side you can see you can even make bacon and carrots and eggs and pizza and all kinds of chocolate chip cookies and muffins and marshmallows and and donuts and these could be pin cushions or you could even make itty bitty tiny ones to make for swaps when you go to camp and you swap with each other you could make tiny little um so so many treats to make swaps 
So that's one of the fun things that you could do. And um, so your pin cushions can be any shape that you want them to be. But today we're just going to do a very basic square shape. So I'm going to fold my pin cushion in half and I'm going to pin it so it doesn't come apart. I want to make sure it's nice and straight. So after I've pinned it on all the edges, Like I told you, this extra edge I like to keep because you can use it to tuck inside to hold your stuffing in place. But I don't need the whole edge, so I'm just going to cut off part of it so it looks like a tab. Because that's how big my hole is going to be that I stuff stuff into. Okay. So you can see that that's how big my hole is going to be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start on one edge and, and just do a quick straight stitch all the way down one side. Now this is when a thimble is really going to help me because now that I'm going through some thicker thread, it's starting to push back on my fingers and be a little bit pokey. So a thimble is a really good thing to have at this point. So now when I get to this corner, I'm going to turn the corner and go over to the side just a tiny bit to where my opening hole is at. And then I'm going to make a tiny little knot right here on the edge of my hole. I'm going to go one, two, three, and through the side. Snip that off. Now I could take the pins out of that side. Now I'm going to do the other side. Make sure I put a knot on the end of my thread. I'm going to do a straight stitch right down the edge of this side. So we have our pin cushion like that. And then what we're going to do is instead of sewing off my um, thread and making a knot right there, I'm just going to leave my thread on and just be very, very careful. And what I'm going to do so that my thing turns inside out really easy, I'm going to quickly clip off the corners just very carefully make sure you're not snipping your thread you don't want to cut your thread pieces but if you clip off the corners then when you turn your pin cushion inside out it'll work much much better so now that I've got my piece all sewn together I'm going to turn it inside out and a really good thing to use to push them inside out is like a pencil. You can use a pencil, you can use a chopstick, anything like that, and that will push your corners out for you. So you're going to get all the corners pushed out. And then once you have your corners pushed out, you're going to take a little bit of your stuffing. I'm going to use my homemade sock stuffing I just made. You're going to push it inside that hole. So I think it was Laurel that mentioned having sand. You can use sand inside of your, um, your pin cushions. That makes them heavier. 
because if they're heavy, then they won't roll away. Sometimes people will take a ribbon or a hair bow and they'll tack it onto their pin cushion and that way they'll wear it on their wrist, just like a bracelet, so they can keep their pins and their needles on their wrist. So that's something you can try also. So once you get it, all the stuffing in here that you want, some people like their pin cushions loose, some people like their pin cushions nice and tight. So you're gonna go ahead and close that, that up perfect? like that. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're just gonna take your thread and you're going to use that overhand stitch and you're just gonna close up the hole on the top of your pin cushion. It doesn't have to be pretty. Once you get experienced at stitching, you can make it so it looks pretty. So there's your pin cushion that you can use that's homemade. So I have a secret that I use for my patches that I like to do. My favorite patches to sew are these patches that have the edges that have like the threads that are coating the edges. Um, there's other patches that you can find. Let me see if there's some here. Oh, here's a good example. Ram patches that we get that have fabric on the edge, but it's not wrapped in fabric. It's just kind of there on the edge. Whereas you can see this one has a fabric all the way wrapped, that thready thing. So when you, you use these kinds, you, you have to sew your patch onto your um, vest. You have to make your needle go through all the way through the thickness, up and down through all of this. And that's where I was telling you, it can be sticky and you really have to have a needle when you're pushing that through because when you're sewing it onto your vest, what you're gonna do is you're gonna wanna pin your, your patch in place. You can either pin it with a pin like this, or you can even, like I said, take a tiny little bit of fabric tack and you're gonna put a tiny bit on the back of your patch and then you're gonna stick that in place and it will temporarily glue your fabric onto um, your vest and hold it in place while you're sewing. So I'm gonna show you, for example, with this red thread. So the thing I like about these thread patches, and again, I apologize that my tripod stopped working, so it's a little harder to show you with this camera, but these threads, what I do is I just pick up the edge of the, of the patch with the needle. I'm not going through the whole thickness of the patch. I'm just going through the thread at the top. So when I'm doing my, pretend like this was my, my uh, vest. So if I were gonna be sewing my vest, instead of going through the thickness of the whole vest, I would just pick up the little bit of um, thread on top of my patch, and then I would um, go down here and take a tiny little bite out of the fabric of my, you take a, a piece of, little bite of, of thread and then you take a little bite of your vest and then you take a little bite of your thread and then you take a little bite of your vest and when you pull that thread will end up hiding and the great thing about that is you don't have to match up your but your patch color with your thread color because your thread color can be any color at all i'll show demonstrate it with this red thread on my green patch and you will see that when you pull the thread through, the, um, the patch almost like disappears. So here's my daughter's new vest and here's her new campery patch that she just got for going to one of our virtual camperies here at our council. So we're gonna sew that on the back of her vest. So I'm gonna pin it in place right here in the middle very difficult to get all the way through that patch. So, but what I do is I pin my patch to my vest and then here underneath where the patch is, I take a tiny little bite with my, with my needle so that I can hide my knot underneath my patch. I don't want my knot to show. So my knot's gonna end up staying here underneath my patch and I'm gonna 
tuck those tails inside. So then when I lay my patch down, you can't see the knot. Let's see if that's any better. Okay. Then um, now what I'm going to do is, and again, I apologize for the camera angles. Now you see I've got a green patch and I've got red thread. But it doesn't matter because when I go in here and I catch a few of my thread needles on the edge of the patch, it hides right inside that patch. You can't even see it. And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna just going to take a teeny tiny bite of the vest right next to my patch. Now I didn't have to go through my whole patch. So it's not hard on my fingers. It's not hard on my uh, thimble. I just went through the patch just a teeny tiny bit. And now I'm not going to go through the whole patch again. I'm just going to catch a few of these threads. And you can even take a big bite of your threads. If you don't want to have to make tons and tons of stitches on your patch, you can make a big bite of your threads and then go way over here, like a whole like quarter inch or an eighth of an inch away. And you pull it, it makes that thread hide away into the fabric. So like I said, the other way you can do is just going all the way down through your fabric and all the way up through the whole thing, but it's really hard. And it really hurts your fingers when you go through the middle of the patch. But if you have one of these patches that has a thread edge, it makes it a whole lot faster and easier just to do the thread. Sewing it um, through those threads really keeps your patch on strong. And what's nice is you'll see that my girls were cadets and so they've got a whole bunch of patches from previous camps. I'm trying to see if there's a patch in here that my daughter sewed yet. No, those patches have all been ironed on, which is why they're falling off. But um, when you use this technique, you'll see that on the back of your, of your vest, see there's only a few tiny little stitches. So say that I wanted to take this patch off my old vest and put it onto my new vest. All I would have to do is take my, either my seam ripper or my scissors, and then I would only have like maybe 10 or 15 stitches to clip, whereas if you sewed it on with a sewing machine, you would have like hundreds of stitches to clip off. I wanted to show you one that my mom found that my grandma made when she was in um, Girl Scouts. And oh, it, wow. it has like the exact same things um, that we did, except it's like a little bird. <laughs> that is so cool. I love that. And it's so nice to have things that you can pass down from your grandma. One of the things I was going to share with you that um, that I learned from my grandma is that in the olden days, people would save their hair from their hairbrushes or like their hair from when they got their hair cut and they would stuff those inside of the pin cushions. And that works really well to keep your pins nice and sharp and clean too. But if you were going to save your own hair from like your hairbrushes or from your... Um, hair clippings with all the products we use in our hair today, you probably want to wash it out with something like some Dawn dishwashing soap to make sure all that hair is clean before you put it into your thing. And then like, um, like I have a little pin cushion that has my grandma's hair in it. So now I remember that I've got a little piece of her that I can use when I sew. Some people think it's gross, but that's something that they did in the olden days. Okay, so sewing machine class is something that I was planning on doing next, but I just wanted to start out today with a basic sewing class because sometimes if you're camping and a button comes off your shirt, you it's always a great idea to have your hand sewing basic skills to take care of emergencies. And one of the things I was hoping to have time to get to show you, but I ran out of time, is you can even use that straight stitch to sew up stuffies. And you can kind of see the stitches I started in here the other day. And you can use those stitches to sew your stuffies right back up. So this is my big bed pillow. So if you know how to hand sew things and one of your stuffies gets a hole in it, you can fix it instead of having to send it to the stuffy hospital. <laughs> one of the girls wants to know if you've ever used the clear thread for the patches. Yes, I have used the clear thread. The only problem with the clear thread 
is when you sew, I don't, you probably can't even see it, but I've got it here. You could kind of barely see it with this camera. But the thing about it is when you're hand sewing with clear thread and you try to make that knot in the end of the string, it doesn't like to stay. It's really difficult to get a knot in the end of your string when you're hand stitching. The clear thread works really, really well when you are using it on a sewing machine. And that makes it so convenient because when you're using it on a sewing machine and you don't have clear thread, then you have to switch out the thread and the bobbin both every time you change a patch that has a different color. So this, this clear thread is really, really excellent. And maybe we can show that when we do our sewing machine class. The only problem is with invisible thread, it's very difficult to see on the camera. So, but yes, invisible thread is great. The only other problem is, you know, a regular spool of thread this size may cost you, I don't know, like two or three bucks, but a spool of invisible thread this size can cost you like $12. It's a lot more expensive than regular thread but it really, really is nice when you don't have to switch your thread with every yeah. single color of patches. Since we've yeah. made new friends all over the country, we'll sing yeah. Make New Friends. Everybody cross your hands so we can grab hands with all of our Girl Scout sisters across the country. Okay, grab your hands. Let's sing Make New Friends. To keep the old one is silver and the other's gold. The circle is round and has no end. And how long I want to be your friend. Yay! Okay. That ends our meeting. Thank you for joining Bye, us, two girls. It's been great seeing you all from everywhere. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Have a great night.